Good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, for coming. Also coming with so many. Yvette, the floor is it's yours. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks all for coming. It's really <laughs> impressive. So I appreciate that very much that you're all so interested in um, what I do. And um, well, I don't like really say I because I actually always work collaboratively. So tonight um, I'm going to talk about my most recent projects um, just to give you like an idea of yeah, what I've been thinking around in terms of how we can contribute to the, you know, wider perspectives, let's put it that way, in, in the arts world. And maybe before I start, i just give you like a really quick glimpse of where I'm coming from professionally so that you get an idea where this whole drive and motivation and my mission somehow uh, comes from. So, I mean, I know maybe some of you have read my short bio, but just... To explain, so I'm, I'm an art historian. I grew up in Germany and I studied art history also in, in Germany, in Berlin. Um, at a time, which is around 10 years ago when I finished, where this whole global thing wasn't really a theme, at least not in German art history. So it means that I really studied the classic thing, Renaissance and so on. It was already amazing when we had like a seminar about contemporary art. And um, so kind of, Starting from there, having worked like in the contemporary art business while I was studying, I really started to get annoyed and frustrated by this sort of ignorance towards anything that was happening beyond the European US sphere. And so I decided to do my PhD um, about contemporary art from Africa and the diaspora in a German cultural context, meaning <clears throat> I, I was looking at sort of the history since the 1960s of exhibitions and diaspora artists and so on in, in Germany. And I actually couldn't find someone in Germany who would supervise me because it was a topic no art historian really would know how to handle. And it was also kind of the feedback I would get like in, in the contemporary arts field where I was working at the time was everybody was like, yeah, but what are you gonna you know, write about? And, what is this about? Is it like some sort of identity search? Or, you know, so there was really no real understanding. And yeah, I think it's interesting because of course this has changed, but at least in the German context, it's not that long ago. And so I basically went to, to London, to the UK, to do my PhD, which was kind of revealing for me and very different because the debate was much further also in art history. And um, so I learned a lot, but it was also clear for me that I sort of wanted to go back to, back, uh, back to the German context also and really to see, you know, how I could actually there contribute to, to broaden that debate and to widen that debate. And basically when I came back, I um, started working at the Weltkulturmuseum in Frankfurt so I'm not gonna talk about all the exhibitions I did there, um, but just like as a quick intro, so the Weltkultur Museum in Frankfurt is the Museum of World Cultures, the translation is an is a ethnographic museum with an ethnographic collection. And I, I started working there in 2012 as a curator, as the head of the Africa department, which meant that I was responsible for the ethnographic collection, uh, but also for the contemporary art collection, and I will talk more about this in a minute. And the special thing about that museum at the time was that um, maybe some of you know Clementine Delis, she was a director there at the time, um, that she had introduced a new concept of thinking around how we can actually deal with these ethnographic <coughs> collections. And one aspect of this concept was that um, we would invite contemporary artists, writers, musicians, and so on to work with these collections and build new exhibitions um, around these kind of residences and practices, which is something that is being done more and more now in many other museums um, as well. But one important aspect also why I actually started there or why also she kind of employed me was that um, the museum has a collection of 3,000 artworks from Africa from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, which is quite special 
because um, the museum actually already started um, collecting these works in 1974, so really um, early in comparison to most other museums in Europe, um, kind of really considering a contemporary art production outside of Europe and taking it quite seriously. And uh, what we just see here is sort of a view into the storage. Um, just to give you an impression, it's not like a great photo, but... Um, and so this collection is kind of comprised of different parts. And one part is um, a huge collection of around 1,000 works from Uganda, Kampala, which was collected there in the 60s and 70s. Um, another part is uh, about Senegal, mainly Dakar. The special aspect about that collection um, is that it was actually collected by a Senegalese artist in the 80s called El Hajisi. Maybe some of you know him. He had also recently worked at the Documenta. And um, then uh, another part is uh, work also from South Africa, which I will explain more. But the issue with this whole collection was actually that it was collected in the 70s and 80s mainly, um, and, but then the museum stopped collecting due to budget, due to shifting interests, and so on. And that means that these 3,000 works actually, after move to a new storage, were literally all packed when I came to the museum. So it was really, in a true sense, about unpacking these works and starting to think about, OK, what does it actually mean to have this amount of works from Africa from that time in this German collection, German museum? And what are we doing with this? And how can we actually think around this? How can we you know, open it? How can we give access to it? And <laughs> so one aspect, for example, is with this whole um, Uganda collection that um, yeah, we are kind of co-initiated a research project also with researchers from um, Kampala in Uganda at the Makarere Arts School who have also works from that time that will look into that history and that also now will go you know, regularly to the storages also in Frankfurt and that there's an exchange. Um, so we are really, you know, starting to also to work with this collection. But of course it's really tricky because um, one of the major questions for me was, um, apart from the fact that this is of course part of, a, of different art histories, um, how, you know, how, how we can actually present them uh, in an everyday or today's contemporary art context. And what I'm now going to talk about is an exhibition that, um, okay, okay, um, was working on um, the South African works. So basically, the Frankfurt Museum has 600 works from South Africa. They were collected in 1986. Um, it has a very specific collection history around it because the museum actually um, commissioned a German uh, priest who used to live in South Africa in the 70s um, and the 60s and 70s and also started collecting at the time. Um, his name is Hans Blum. He was very involved in the anti-apartheid anti movement when he lived in South Africa. And when he got back to Frankfurt, the museum asked him whether he would be interested in buying work for, for the museum. So the, he com they commissioned him uh, to go back um, with a certain budget. And he went there in 86, which is um, the height of the state of emergency in South Africa, meaning like the height of the struggle between anti-apartheid movement and the government. And he bought these 600 works only by black South African artists. So he very specifically did that, of course, um, with this really strong political idea of, on the one hand side, in South Africa, making a point of saying this is relevant artwork that's being produced. Um, on the other side, also to bring it back to Germany and um, to say, OK, look, people, this is what's happening there. And this is sort of reflected in this artwork that we have now in the museum. Um, and so there was one exhibition in 1987 with these artworks. And after that, they went, like all the other works, back to the storage and stayed there. And so in 2014, um, I started thinking about wanting to do an exhibition with these works. And at the same time, Gabi Ngobo, um, with whom I'm also now working on the Berlin Biennial, came to Frankfurt to give a lecture. 
And I also showed her the collection, and so we decided to, to work on this together. And I, after she had seen it, or parts of it, I, I went to, to South Africa, Johann to Johannesburg, in 2014 and gave a lecture to some of her students about this collection and this history. And they were super critical and they hated it. And they were like, what, how is this possible? Again, this white dude comes, you know, takes all the works and is now in Germany. We thought, great. So um, for us, this was really the very first sort of entry point of um, thinking around how we can, you know, take this collection out of the basement, literally, and talking about its history, but at the same time making it contemporary. So the first step for us was that we invited four of those students to actually work with us on this exhibition. And basically over the course of two years, they would do research by looking at archival materials that I would also send them, looking at artworks from the collection. Um, but the most crucial part actually was that they would start meeting with these older artists that had work in the collection from the 80s, so those that were still alive. And this was a very interesting experience for both sides, but especially for, for the students, because when they started talking to these older artists, they had a very different view of this whole thing than the youngsters actually had. So they were actually saying, well, this was a very special moment at the time when Hans Blum came to buy this works, because of course, there were lots of expat collectors and others, but most of them were actually, you know, not very respectful, mostly trying to, you know, pay next to nothing for the work, often not really bothering to really engaging with the work, and that he was someone he, who was really very different in that sense. And so, yeah, they had all a very actually positive um, kind of a memory of this, and also they all remembered him instantly when the youngsters started talking to him. So through that, um, and additionally to the fact that then um, we actually found out that Hans Blum is still alive and lives in Frankfurt. So um, we started also talking with him and he was actually very happy that we were looking at this again, also from a very critical view, of course. So um, we made a film, basically Gabi with the students first in, in South Africa. So you see that that's still there in the entrance area in the Frankfurt Museum, where it's a recording of these conversations between the young artists and the older generation, um, which made quite clear that it is not so easy and it's much more complicated than just saying, oh, it's like this or it's like that. Um, literally, no, it's not just black and white, but it's actually much more entangled and much more complex. And um, so this was kind of a, became like a key yeah, work in, in the exhibition, um, these conversations um, with the older generation artists, but also like here you see Sam and Luli, who's a gener younger generation um, art historian from Johannesburg, um, who talked about that time and also about this kind of um, rewriting of art history that's only starting now, because at the time, of course, there were people writing about these black artists, but yeah, it was a white art history, so it was very specific in the terminology and so on that was being used. Um, so this is one aspect, and I just, you know, give you some um, impressions. So I decided to talk about this project also because although we already started in 2014, it is kind of a long-term project which only finished this summer because this summer Gabi and I actually um, brought it to Johannesburg and uh, showed it there at the Johannesburg Art Gallery. So the installation shows that will follow will be at the Johannesburg Gallery, so the show is actually still running until November there. Um, so this was one aspect, looking at these intergenerational conversations and kind of, you know, seeing also that process that came out from there, um, parallelly with the conversations with Hans Blum, which made it also for us as curators, of course, in a way more complicated because it would have been much easier if he would have been dead because then we could have just, you know, have our opinion and do what we want and that's it. But so now he was this really nice little 80 year old guy who was very interesting and we had like really interesting conversations with him and so that was, yeah, it was good because it made things more complicated. And um, so 
Another aspect of these conversations that were really important, also reflected in, in the catalog, um, was then for us as curators to think about, yeah, how, apart from having this input from the younger generation, how, how do we make an exhibition that's not just, you know, taking them out, the works, you know, cleaning them from the dust and saying, okay, this is what happened, and it's like this and that, so how can we make this link to today? And then we, you know, we were reading different texts, and one text is by Albi Sachs. He's a really important um, uh, uh, struggle, uh, like fighter, civil rights fighter in, in South Africa, and a judge. And he uh, gave this speech, which was in close, in I think, 89, so, so shortly before um, the end of apartheid, where he says, and what about love? So he basically asked this question, saying, like, okay, we have this struggle, we are fighting, um, but what, what happened to love? And, I mean, he was meaning it in a sense, not necessarily just the love in a relationship, but really love in a much broader sense as a notion. And so we thought this is actually how we can access this collection. So why don't we just, you know, kind of turn it around so it's not about anger or frustration or so on, but actually we, we access it to the notion of love, but actually really thinking um, about love in its most difficult um, possibilities. So, you know, as you can see here, we have kind of made this sort of list, let's say, um, where it's like love as a feeling, but also as a political act, as an outlet, and so on and so on. So really seeing all these different layers of how you can work with this notion of love. And so basically, through this reading, we um, chose the works from the collection. Um, but at the same time, it was not only kind of this kind of guiding principle for us through that collection, um, but it was also sort of reflected in those works in a way that, for example, those older generation artists said, like, yeah, you know, making art was this one thing that no one could take away from us. So, you know, we had to struggle and it was difficult and there were no real structures for black artists, but we could produce. And this was an outlet for us to actually, you know, be able to work with our emotions um, with anger as much as joy and everything that was happening in life. So, um, for us, yeah, it became really that we said actually each work in this collection is a labor of love. So this is where sort of the, the title comes from. On one hand side, referencing this access point of the notion of love, but on the other side also reading these works um, as these very specific um, yeah, labors of love. And this was really important for us because as I mentioned before, in the art history written about these artists, because I mean, there are many today that actually are really well known South African stars, you know, so, so there's like um, Sam Lengletter, David Kulwane, so they're really big names today. <coughs> and in that art history that had been written about them, it's mostly that they're just all lumped together. So it's like the black artists from this generation, or it's called township art or traditional art and so on. And so we felt like, okay, how can we sort of try to make this little first step to break that open, and that was by saying, okay, of course it's all work from a very specific context, a very specific time that all these artists have in common, but of course it's also very individual narratives that you see there that you can't just overlook. And um, so, also in a way how we were trying to, to present the work, it was really a lot about giving that space to the singular individual artists in this um, bigger narrative. And the other aspect was also looking at this whole German collection history with, with Hans Blum, um, that he, um, of course, was sort of um, on this mission when he went there, and he was very determined. He took lots of risk when he bought those works and parts. Um, so also just this coming together is also a labor of love, you know, of this whole, you know, coming together of these collections. So this was like the other angle in a way. But of course, it was always also clear that um, 
we had also in the conversation with Hans Blum that in the first place when he came to South Africa, he was a missionary. So of course it was something that we couldn't also ignore, that it was something, you know, very problematic also in the first place why he was there. Um, so we wouldn't also not hide that. So I don't have like a photo of this, but we would also have like a reference image from an archive um, referencing the missionaries at the time and so on. So of course this was not something to be ignored, but it was just important to us, yeah, to, to show these different layers and, and sort of entanglements that actually come with these collection histories. And in that sense, um, oh, that's really dark, I'm sorry. This is one of the works from the younger students. Um, so, yeah, in a sense, it was also really important to have this show in both places. So to have it in Frankfurt, because it has this very specific German connection, and it was this question of what to do with this collection, uh, what does it mean today to have this collection in Germany. But at the same time, of course, it was really important for us also to bring it to Johannesburg, to sort of bring it back and um, to kind of have there the possibilities also with you know, an audience there, with, with those artists that are in the collection and so on, to have conversations, which of course were very different than the ones that we had in Germany. But both were of course very important to have them and to, yeah, to, to open up that collection also to that, you know, these different kinds of audiences. So, yeah, this is just an example of, um, yeah, I, w in my work or in my collaborations, try to, as an art historian really, and as a curator, so I really always see this very close together. I always, of, I would either also rather say I'm an art historian that also does exhibitions because I kind of see it from that perspective, um, which is an ongoing process of thinking around how we can make certain histories visible and work with them. And that, it's, that doesn't mean, it's not about denying other historical art narratives, but it's really about just saying what's also there and kind of adding to that. And so I'm just gonna switch to this because this is very connected to what I just said, um, this whole thinking around how you know, we can make these different narratives visible and add them to everything that's already there, um, which is Contemporary End. It's, a, it's an art magazine which I co-founded around four and a half years ago. And yeah, it came out of the same mood that I described before, of this sort of you know, being annoyed about this ignorance uh, towards what's happening um, in terms of what diaspora artists are producing, but also what's going on in Africa on the continent. And so together with my co-founder, Julia, Julia Große, we, yeah, decided to just give it a try to, to build a platform which actually brings these different debates and spaces and artistic productions together. And of course, it was very logical for us to do that online because this is the best how you can access it from wherever you are. And um, we decided to also make it very much a focus on visual arts. So it's not fashion or film, but really hardcore <laughs> visual arts because we are both art, art historians, so it's really you know, coming from that. And um, yeah, as you can see, we have like the different categories and so on. And what was important for us um, from the beginning was firstly, you know, when you think about a platform like that, the looks and the name. <laughs> It's very tricky if you do something which is focusing on perspectives from Africa. Um, it was clear we didn't want to have like warm colors that everyone associates with Africa, like orange or brown and so on. Simply, not because this is, I mean, it's a different theme in itself, but it was specifically because, um, yeah, I guess this is similar here in a debate also that we constantly encounter this notion of African art, and it becomes very problematic because in 90% of the cases when people use it, it's just very unreflected because it just puts everything into this one category. 
And of course, it can't be. You know, I don't have to tell you that Africa is not a country. So um, it really came from this thought that we were saying, OK, African art does not exist. So because a performance artist in Addis has nothing to do with the painter in Dakar. It's very different. So you know, someone in Addis might have more connection with someone in Oslo than actually that painter in, in Dakar. And um, so we were thinking it's a super tricky thing because on the one hand side, it was about breaking open that category of making a point of saying, look people, it's not that easy why you keep doing this. Um, but on the other side, of course, it was a platform that was focusing on these perspectives. So the big question was, okay, how do we do this without not perpetuating this category because we are like kind of focusing on African perspectives. And so we said, okay, I mean, we still have to bring it into the name at some point, just that it's clear what we are doing. So in the beginning, um, we actually had the subtitle Platform for International Art from African Perspectives. Very specifically, it's saying African perspectives and not African art. Um, and for us, this really is, becomes more so kind of a political term in the sense, yeah, it is about showing these practices that are sort of <coughs> marginalized and so on. And um, still the name was um, a big issue. And so at some point it was clear that we were saying, okay, actually um, it is about contemporary art productions, of course with reference to, to history and so on. So, but actually it's about that we all are contemporary and so many other things. So you can be contemporary and born in Tanzania, now living in New York, having a gallery in Milan or whatsoever. And um, so really saying, okay, this is something that brings these topics and reviews and interviews together. Um, but at the same time, it says also, yes, but we see how complex everything else is. And um, so this is where the name comes from, basically, contemporary and, and then you can add whatever, whoever you are um, to it. And um, now after four and a half years, kind of, yeah, it has grown. So um, we have like a huge network now <coughs> with lots of people working with us um, in Africa and the diaspora. We're being read in 160 countries and um, we decided now it's actually we made our point, and that's why we removed the subtitle. So it's just contemporary end now. Um, because we felt like, okay, after four years having done this, we don't need this anymore because it's actually from the beginning we wanted to move beyond that. We wanted to be a contemporary art magazine, and like many other magazines, we have this focus on these debates. Um, yes. So, but apart from, of course, having the focus on contemporary art production, let's say, from African perspectives, which by the way also means like Afro-Brazilian and so on, so this is like, yeah, quite, you know, really what we see. Um, it was also really important for us to still have regularly also texts and features that make that references to art historical moments. Because this comes really from this experience that now with this sort of, people call it hype around arts from Africa or global arts or so on, you know, I often made this experience that people behave like as if this just popped up five years ago because just they know about it now. So um, it was really important for us to keep that kind of work that I, for example, also had been doing like with the show that you saw before to make this point of, of course, there are, there are all these other art histories. And of course, you know, if you see something that's happening now, it has certain reference points where it's coming, coming from. And so that's just an example, for example, exhibition histories. It's a series that we have where we feature important um, art exhibitions that have been happening in the past decades. And, you know, just for people that have the opportunity, if they don't know about it, to just, yeah, get an idea. And then another example is that, although that we're online, as you will see while I move on, that also the physical thing is really important for us. One aspect here is um, another series, it's inside the library, where we actually 
ask libraries um, in different spaces, you know, as you can see from, from Lagos to, to um, Johannesburg to Cairo, that are not necessarily <coughs> so well known, but that actually are really important in terms of the books and magazines that they have. And they would, uh, we would ask them to kind of feature one or two uh, books or manifestos or magazines that they think are really crucial. And so we bring that together here to give an idea, again, thinking around these you know, parallel art histories and narratives that are there to make that visible by saying, of course, there are also other spaces where you could go and actually learn about these histories and find the original manifestos and so on. Um, and then, um, yeah, as I said, the, the online space, of course, is the main space for us. So this is where we have also the biggest turnover. But um, it, at some point, we also felt like it becomes really important to yeah, have a physical manifestation of the text because it is always different to have like the physical thing. So after a year, we started to bring out uh, a print issue. So this is, uh, as you see, like this kind of newspaper format that we give out for free. It comes out two, uh, twice a year. And it usually comes out also on the occasion of a specific event, like the Dakar Biennial or Bamako, but also Documenta. So for us, it's of course about things that are happening on the continent, but as much also featuring artists um, that are on events like Documenta or Venice Biennial and so on, because often there is not necessarily you know, a focus on, on these artists if they are part of these events. And what you see here is actually a photo that comes from a collaboration that we did last year which um, our colleagues from Sao Paulo, who are doing a magazine that's called o Omenilic, and which is actually focusing on Afro-Brazilian cultural perspectives, not only visual arts. And we've, been, we've known them from a, for a while, and so we did this sort of collaboration where they also co-edited um, a, a print issue, which then came out for the Sao Paulo Biennial last year, where it was also distributed on the Biennial and so on, and it was, yeah, with a focus on Afro-Brazilian visual arts perspectives. Um, this is like, the latest one, which is um, focusing on, on arts education or education, the whole questions around, around that. And um, then somehow with the work we do, of course, there are also sort of these different, I don't know how you would call it, but maybe strands that come out of it. And um, apart from the print issue, there's another project um, that is now currently in Berlin where we were asked to do a reading room for a project um, of the IFA Gallery. It's the Institute for Foreign Relations in Berlin. And they're doing a project, a year-long project, which is dealing with colonial legacies. And so they asked us to do a reading room um, referencing thinking around colonialism. And then we thought, like, okay, that's, it has to be better than that. And so what we did is um, think about a book selection which, of course, brings in important books that talk about colonialism, postcolonialism, decolonialization, and so on, but also bringing in books that usually people would not necessarily think of if they think of colonial legacy. So, for example, we have a book about Wall Street or other books about certain economics, um, which we also have books, um, which you can see here, which is like about German expressionism. So, of course, most people, is, at least in Germany, are not really seeing it from that colonial perspective because it's like a very important avant-garde movement in art history, but it's also highly problematic in the way how they were inspired by Africa and how they would depict black people. Or we would have, um, I think you don't see it here, but it's... Um, a very classic art historical book, at least where I studied um, by, by Gombrich. It's called The History of Art. So it's like the Bible everybody needs to know if they study art history. But of course, it's just Western art history. So we would put in these books. And so, of course, people would be confused, saying, yeah, but eh, it's nothing to do with colonialism. But of course, because they are kind of you know, reflecting how these exclusions have you know, manifested themselves in these very particular 
you know, moments and things that we are so used to also in a way. And um, so we called it the Center of Unfinished Business because it was clear, of course, if you talk about colonialism and the legacies, it is something that we can't even start grasping with a reading room like that and also a project like they do, like over a year can't, and of course it's something that is an ongoing issue. So it's just kind of, you know, little, 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 little scratch on, on how we can think about this. And as you can see there, we also brought in videos. So we had like different kind of music videos um, of all sort of people that, um, yeah, are sort of relevant in a way that they not necessarily say like, I, I talk about colonialism, but of course, you know, they're confronting certain political issues and, and so on. Um, yeah, this may be just uh, as another manifestation how, you know, this physical entry points to, to content plays a role for us. So apart from the print issue and, and the center, which is also something we actually want to make travel to different spaces. And or maybe something that's really important I forgot to say is about the center is um, that we wanted to connect it also to Berlin and to the city in some way. And so the books that we brought together is on the one hand part something, books that we just bought. Um, on the other hand, um, books from the library, from the IFA gallery, from that gallery, uh, which hosted it, um, looking into that library and seeing what they actually put together in terms of what they think is relevant to colonialism. But then we also um, collaborated with a small community library in Berlin uh, from an association that's called Each One Teach One, who have a, gal uh, who have a library by only um, yeah, diaspora or writers from Africa, uh, also very much looking at Afro-German histories, and which is really small reference library, which of course hardly anyone knows outside a certain community in Berlin. So we also worked with them in a sense that we brought in books from that library into the center. Um, with that idea of connecting, but also with the point of saying, look people, there are already things out there, you know? It's not necessarily always those institutions like the IFA Gallery or others that need to come and do these things. It's already there. And so by just bringing in and mentioning them so that people you know, ideally get also a sense and then say, okay, maybe I just pass by and have a look what they actually have in their library. So, and yeah, this is just um, a book that we brought out which actually has texts that we have published online. And I just mentioned it briefly because this was again for us um, a thinking around how not only making content accessible but also how to talk about certain narratives and so um, we felt like especially after the time that we have now existed and of course all the texts are online but they also disappear because it becomes this archive that's more and more endless to kind of bring out again texts and put them together in a different way, of course a very subjective way, but also through that way you can read these texts again in a different kind uh, of perspective because how we put them together and how we're referencing them in the book. And so basically um, the starting point of the book is, um, is an interview with Helen Zebidi, she's this older generation artist from South Africa, very important figure, and it's a very beautiful interview we did with her for the Sao Paulo print issue and she talks about certain notions of her ideas of um, yeah, tradition, colonialism, and so on. And so we took this and sort of looked for texts in our archive that were sort of referencing certain notions that she talks about, but from very different perspectives, like a younger artist or like an art historian and so on. Of course, at the time, not with the, they didn't know that this would kind of be interesting to reference, but now in the book, putting them together, they kind of build this new kind of sense of, of archive thinking around these notions. And that's why we also, you know, because we didn't want to put a title like this on the book, and so we took actually a quote from that interview. Um, and then another part that is really important beyond the online thing is, of course, the network. So the end is actually only the end because of all those people 
uh, we are working with and with all those writers that are part of this and that are contributing. And um, what we started last year is um, with the support of the Ford Foundation, so I hope it's recorded, they know I mentioned them. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing this series of, of <coughs> workshops in different cities in Africa, or that's where we started. So this is a photo from um, a critical writing workshop in Nairobi last year. And so this is again something, of course, there are lots of writing workshops, so we were not trying to reinvent the wheel, so that's existing. But the problem we always kind of had is that, you know, you have this workshop, I know, initiated by the Goethe Institute or something like that in some one of these cities, and it's happening in two days, and then it's like, okay, cool, and great to meet you, and then after that, nothing happens. And so we thought, like, okay, if we do this, because, of course, it's great for our work also to connect with the younger generation of, of writers, it can only be the beginning. So basically... These workshops take place um, three days. We invite tutors that then yeah, um, you know, teach and have exercises in a very you know, classic sense. But then the idea really is um, that one major part is that it is about firstly, yeah, also being practical about how you can actually deal with this very difficult career of an art writer, especially in, in African cities. It's like an issue in itself. I mean, I can't go into it, but it is. But also to say, okay, actually, it's um, about then having the tools also to start pitching text, not only to the end, of course, also to the end, but also to the tutors getting the possibility and also, you know, kind of go beyond that barrier of maybe not knowing whether, you know, you can just send in things and so on. Uh, to other outlets. So basically, really to start a relationship with us as a magazine, but also with other um, outlets, and so that it continues. That's one aspect, which also really works. So people then afterwards really start pitching things to us and saying, look, I want to do this interview with this artist, and so on. On the other side, um, there's also a mentoring program, which continues after the workshops with a certain number of participants, um, which goes over a year, where they can then work with one of the tutors on a more individual basis by yeah, handing in texts and um, then getting feedback and so on, like in a very classic sense. Um, they get a little stipend and so on um, to just keep, keep doing things, keep writing and having a reason, reason also to write, because of course many of these youngsters have also other jobs and so on, because how would you be able to live as an arts writer? I mean, it's even, it's difficult here also. Yeah, and so um, what we did with the Nairobi workshop is that it was really such an amazing group that we did a special print issue which was completely written, edited, designed, produced in Nairobi by the guys in Nairobi. So it just came out a couple of weeks ago. And um, with the idea that, um, you know, we actually wanted to go beyond this sort of artsy thing. So it came from one from the idea that, yeah, those younger writers are often like also in different places, as I said before, where they work and so on. But also this is something that continuously also interests us and something I maybe haven't really mentioned, but it's really relevant also to the exhibitions and so on that we do, um, to reach out, to reach out beyond um, art institutions and the usual audience and so on. And so what we did is that we produced 10,000 of these print issues and um, they were distributed like guerrilla style all over Nairobi. So we had these skaters and others that would just be like in the streets and give it to people. And the thought with this was, apart from, yeah, go beyond that gallery and that museum, also, you know, it was interesting then the feedback that came because people suddenly would maybe read that the cousin of your friend is a writer, has written this text, and suddenly it's a totally different access to this whole theme of arts because it becomes relatable. And um, so, yeah, this was basically the idea behind it, to just reach beyond, beyond that, um, especially in contexts also like Nairobi where yeah, you have even less cultural pages in the newspapers and so on as you just don't have that. 
in the same way like um, we, for example, have here. So yeah, I mean, in that sense, um, the work with the end is very much intertwined about the digital world and the network, but also always, you know, coming back to the ground. And of course, nothing can actually substitute working with real people, you know, and nothing is the same like sitting with someone in a room or a Skype conversation can now, you know, can never be that. So of course, it's always very important for us um, to have to try to find possibilities to actually combine these two, two things. Um, and then maybe just to the end, because I can imagine that some people are really curious about this, um, it's the Berlin Biennial. Um, I can't say that much yet, it's just too early, I'm sorry. Um, we possibly will publish the, the artist list in December and also the title of, of the biennial, but maybe just a little thing, which is something that we've also kind of brought out because we have published our first statement already. Um, it's this sort of design of the biennial that um, if you go on the website or Facebook, you will see it. Also on Facebook, it's kind of moving like this GIF and it's like moving like this, like these tectonic plates that are going in and outside. And um, this is uh, something we very consciously chose um, as, as a corporate identity sounds very evil, but it's something that is like the, the theme, like the visual theme of the biennial. And um, it comes, actually these kind of patterns directly reference um, camouflage ships in, in the World War, when you would see like that these patterns and that made them harder to spot on the radar. So at some point you would see them, but you know, it was really hard. And this um, was really interesting for us, um, basically coming from uh, the experience that, yeah, being uh, in, in a curatorial team that's all black, which hasn't, has, has not happened before, at least not with the Berlin Biennial, raising a very specific kind of attention, raising also very specific kind of expectations, which are often connected to the fact that people think they already know what we're doing because we're black. So um, it can be only something with Africa and colonialism. And um, we really felt like, of course, this is all relevant. I mean, we've been all working in this for years. Um, and of course, this is our perspective. But we really are ready to go beyond these notions and expectations. And so we were thinking on the one hand side, around the notion of opacity. In a sense, not of saying we wanna make things secret or like that you can't see things, but opacity in a way of once you get through it, it makes things clear, but in a different way. And so what we did also with our first statement, which kind of is pointing towards the direction where we will be going with the biennial is that we very consciously wrote a text which doesn't use any of those words. So it doesn't use colonialism, post-colonialism, decolonization, diversity, transnational, and so on. Um, and this really comes um, from a position where we say, of, of course, these are legitimate notions, and that's not at all the question. But it comes more from this feeling of, you know, for example, in Germany, with having like every other day a talk about, you know, in museums how they can decolonize their collections and so on and it's like comes these terms really overused in many contexts where you suddenly get this feeling it's not really even graspable anymore because people maybe don't even really know what exactly they're saying or what this notion maybe where it's coming from and so um, that's why we had the feeling we want to shift beyond this and try to find a grammar or language that of course talks about similar things but just in a different way. And this is all I can tell you. So for more, you just have to come to Berlin next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>